Well, this is my new ZX7 Nakamichi cassette deck. Just arrived this morning on a Sunday. And uh, this is the first time it's about to be powered on. I've taken the cover off and just had a quick look. And uh, I know of its alleged uh, fault. It's to do with recording, but it would appear to be uh, intermittent. So it may or may not record straight away. Something to uh, sort out. But initially, I just noticed a couple of things. First off, it's, apart from a couple of nicks here and there, it's in really nice condition. Uh, very clean. Very little dust inside. So, no, very nice condition. I'm very pleased about that. The uh, first thing is that <laughs> I noticed that down in there there's a little belt caught so when the, the previous owner was uh, changing some belts, I believe that all the belts have been changed, it uh, got caught in there and it stuck down there and uh, I can't pull it out until I remove the whole mechanism so <laughs> there you go. Let's hope it doesn't interfere with anything. The other thing is that uh, the, the boots that cover the uh, bias and level switches, geez, they're hard to get off. I had to be so careful and, uh, and most of them I actually pulled out the little knob that came, I'll do one here, pulled out the little knob with it. So very carefully I'll put them back in. So I've left the, the booty covers off. Uh, I can't see myself leaving them uh, on un until I've actually uh, settled down into a routine of, uh, of uh, recording whereby I know exactly what I'm using and, and so on. I'll very rarely use the metal position. It, uh, I've only got two metal tapes and they'll be used mainly for testing not so much for uh, actually using although I may do one side of each just uh, for music purely just to have, have a reference sample I suppose okay now these buttons the EX, SX and ZX I've noticed that the, the SX button doesn't release properly when you when you when you press one of the others or it takes uh, it takes one of the others before you can release it. Yeah, so you press that, it, the others should be released. And that one, oh, it worked that time. Yeah, obviously the bar that goes across there for uh, selecting them is, needs a bit of a, a grease up. Uh, they're, they're not releasing properly. A similar thing happened with uh, the uh, Pioneer amplifier in for my computer it had the same problem you had to hold in one of the buttons for ages before it would slowly slip into place <laughs> but uh, oh, that shouldn't be too hard the next thing is that uh, some of these switches uh, aren't exactly vertical in their normal position these three are okay but these two aren't this one is slightly off by oh, a little bit both positions are too much to the right so that one needs to be turned around a little bit and this one here that's that's actually the the left hand one even though it's vertical so it's at a one full notch if you go around to the fourth one it's horizontal instead of up here where it says rec so so they've got to be straightened up uh, what else it's 110 volt of course which uh, uh, I hate 110, 120 volt stuff. I really do. Now the transformer, which uh, I'll give you a look at. That transformer is uh, properly shielded with a, a metal case uh, on both sides. So to replace it won't be easy. I do have a 
a similar size transformer that's actually 60 watts instead of this 40 watts and it has uh, I can make do with the windings the windings are 15 0 15 volts and a 5 volt so one center tap 15 either side and a, another tap which is uh, just 5 volts AC so with this other transformer I've got I can actually uh, do it even though it's just one multi-tap secondary winding the reason being is that this one here the uh, ground is uh, the same for uh, both uh, windings so effectively it uh, doesn't really matter I'll uh, I'll connect uh, the I'll connect it in such a way that it doesn't matter and there'll be just the one ground or zero volts so but the hardest part will be making up a, a metal plate I'm loath to actually pull this one apart and use it that's not a really nice idea uh, it'd be good to keep that as a uh, so that I could have the ability to always put it back to 120 volts if needed or if I ever sold the machine or whatever I'd have the transformer with it and say look yeah it can be brought back to 120 volts if you if you if you're so keen um, but there's only a couple of countries in the world where that would be the case main one being the US of course and and uh, I, doubt, I doubt it oh. oh it's got a little oh, it's got a little plate down there ah, where the uh, 120 240 switch would have been <laughs> oh dear how sad never mind I'd, I'd yeah, if I could only get a proper transformer. But uh, naturally, most of the second-hand good stuff is from the States is because they buy most of the stuff. Being the, the so-called richest country in the world, lots of uh, money being spent on such things. Like cars and anything electronics. Fortunately, there's a few places in the world, like the rest of the world, that uh, is 220 or 240 or 230. On that point, uh, actually, uh, the world uh, uh, was meant to be uh, heading towards 230 volts, not 220 or 240, but 230. The reason being is that it's a compromise and that uh, all the uh, 110 or 120 volt countries were going to... Uh, uh, head towards 115 so that everyone is either 230 or 115 and it would make life a lot easier but uh, I, I guess uh, what's happened is that most of the power supplies in the world it was just going to be too costly to change their grid voltage and the other thing is that um, a lot of new supplies now are switch mode and they're 100 to 240 volt uh, capable and uh, no need to uh, switch them anymore because uh, transformers are uh, I won't say illegal but very difficult to make instruments with transformers in them these days because of CE requirements there's a there's a certain amount of uh, voltage current lag that you're allowed and with transformers it can be too much that power factor is uh, of a real concern for uh, for uh, power supply distribution companies and uh, grids and so on so the more resistive everything is the easier it is to maintain the power factor or the current to voltage uh, leading or lagging i think from memory uh, having an inductive load the oh, i forget now I, I think the the voltage leads the current and uh, with a capacitive load the current leads the uh, voltage so that's why a lot of motors have capacitors uh, across them to tr try and help with the power factor but but any transformer will have um, a, uh, a lag between the voltage and current and it causes havoc so I think that's uh, the other reason why 
Um, it's probably not going to change much in the future. Maybe new grids might, uh, or when they get new equipment, might uh, update to uh, 230. But uh, it's probably not that much a big of a deal to to us home users anyway. I'm told that, uh, or I've read a lot, that uh, even in the US, a lot of homes have 220 volt now rather than uh, uh, 110. Well, they have 110, but it's just uh, half a phase of two phase 220. It's uh, so what what I'm saying is that well, the houses get 220 to the uh, meter box, but then it gets split up into two lots of 110s, and all you need to do is to connect across the 220, and uh, you've got a 220 volt outlet, which a lot of homes, you know, if they have a garage and they want to have a lathe or a few other things, they need a bit more grunt, and that's what they do. And uh, so in a way, some of them have uh, the best of two worlds, but but uh, unless you've got a, a newer home or a factory yet or a Something like that. If you live in an apartment, uh, you won't have 220. You'll only have uh, 110. So, it's speaking of voltage, it's about time I turned it on. Well, you're with me. This is the first time it's been turned on. I've got a couple of tapes. I've got an amplifier, which I will turn on. I've got it connected. So, well, cross fingers that it's all, all good. Because I have blown up at least two bits of equipment uh, with uh, 240 into a uh, 110 volt uh, machine. Years ago, my very first DVD player was a Panasonic uh, 310, I think. It was the very first DVD player in the world with... DTS and so I spent $1,400 and got it imported from the States and it was quite good at the time no high def of course it was all standard def but it was such a revelation after uh, VHS but anyway uh, a couple of years later I accidentally put in 220 into it and it, it, it blew a fuse and oh I thought oh god all that money wasted anyway it turned out I did just blow a fuse, but it also blew up the MOV the, uh, in the power supply. So I removed that, turned it back on, it was okay. Uh, so the MOV actually protected the whole thing, thank goodness. But anyway, just recently I've, I've got a HD DVD player, which is also 120, and uh, I was trying to find a HD DVD player to play something, and I'd forgotten that I'd actually bought one or two from the US, uh, one of them cheaply, and I, I just, it, it didn't have a, a line on it with uh, the two pin plug. It just had a, a like a figure eight socket on the back. So I, so I, I thought, oh yeah, and I plugged it in, and about ten seconds later, <laughs> smoke and hiss everywhere, and oh, I thought, oh no, I know what I've done. Uh, so I haven't looked at that yet. Um, we'll see what happens. It was uh, a really, it was the top of the line quality Toshiba player. It was a really nice brush metal and everything. Hopefully it's just the power supply and I, I might be able to uh, resurrect it somehow. Anyway, back to this, still to turn it on. Now I've got a 110 volt step down transformer, but it's not a transformer. It's one of these newer electric electronic type That's why I got it so cheap. It was only 59 Australian dollars for a, a kilowatt 110 volt uh, device. It's just there Oh, it's a GSD 1000 made by Gen Power $59 brilliant. Okay, I'll turn it on well, that's on now. Oh, let's uh, breathe a whatever and let's go. Oh, works. <laughs> I mean, that's always a good sign, isn't it?
Right. The capstone is spinning. All right, that's good. It's nice and quiet. Let's uh, play a few seconds of Brothers in Arms. Let's see if it'll work. Hmm. Um. Oh yes, hear it straight away. Well, that's all I can play for Mr. YouTube. I'll have to try and find something that uh, I'm allowed to. Okay, I've got uh, Hotspur, whatever that is. Hotspur by Hotspur. Well, if you don't hear this, then you'll know it's whatever. Well, that sounds uh, quite reasonable. That's nice to know. Now, recording. That's one thing about uh, this machine is that uh, it doesn't automatically select what type of tape you have. You have to select it. So, so there's a bit of a procedure involved. It's a very manual. It's a very manual machine. The uh, the other machine that I'd like to get the CR7. Uh, but it's just a bit too much money for me at the moment. That is almost totally automatic, like my Denon 44HX. It's just automatic and uh, so easy. But this one, it's all manual, but I'm looking forward to that because uh, the, the truth is, most of the time, that's what I want, especially when recording. Now, if I'm just in the drinking mood, well, I probably wouldn't use this machine for playing back tapes because I'd have to continually make sure that I had the SX or the EX selected. But, and the Dolby 2 for that matter, because I, I will do a few that are Type-C. But uh, with my other CR5 and Denons, I'll just stick it in, just make sure of the, uh, the Dolby, and that's it. Away it goes. Yeah, with this one you even have to make sure you've got the right EQ. So, so say your uh, SX, you've got to make sure it's up in the 70 position. Yeah, very manual, but that's okay. It'll be it'll be nice. It will certainly uh, allow me to test out how different tapes perform. Right, recording. It's in now. I'm trying to think how you do it. Have I got the tape in? Oh yes. Yes, the notch is still there. Oh, okay. The other machines, you just press record, both uh, the Nakamichi and the Denons, you just press record and it pssst, goes into record mode and to set it off on its way, you just press uh, play. But uh, this one, I, I think you've got to press both. Yeah. So... It's the same as just pressing record on the others. Now, this is where we... Oh, okay. Here's the azimuth. Oh. Don't know what set it off, but pressing that, I think, seemed to set it off into recording. So here I am recording. And uh, the idea is that you, oops, uh, 
Oh, doesn't seem to want to. How far are you meant to move us? Seems to have timed out. Oh, okay, maybe this is what's wrong with the recording maybe it this is what's wrong oh hang on I've got to go to source don't I I think Well, something's gone up in smoke. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. How sad, never mind. So that, what does that mean? Well, the azimuth was working and then it didn't work. So it could be the whole, well, I'll have to look at the circuit, but obviously the azimuth circuitry is the first thing to, thing to look at as to why. Now the smoke, it was was coming up through here, just a little smoke trail. Hopefully I can find out what it is. Ah dear, oh well that's sad. I was, I was hoping it would be just uh, simple, simples. I'm just hoping that um, whatever that smoke was, that it, it's not something that can't easily be repaired. I'm rather tempted to... <coughs> whatever I did, I had it on for a while, so... So it probably wouldn't hurt to put it on again a little bit. It's sort of still working, so that's good. If it was a total failure, I'd be, I'd be crying in my beer. But uh, I'm, I'm 
just have to go through it with a, a multimeter initially and just try and see if I can see anything terrible. Yes, the yeah, recording certainly doesn't work. Oh well, that's exactly as it was promised. He did say he, it got working momentarily, but let's see if we can find out what that is. All right, I've got a lot of work ahead of me, and before I start videoing again. Well, the sad news is the uh, recording not only works, but doesn't work in a big way. It still does playback. Uh, quite okay but I was getting a puff of smoke that came out of above the uh, big power supply capacitors I thought I'd turn it back on and just see if I could see where the smoke was coming from to give me a clue but it, it then just became very vague as to where it was from and then after a while it stopped giving smoke at all so I had to give give that plan away the uh, recording yeah it does not seem to want to work now so I can only speculate at the moment that the whole uh, bias area and recording in particular the bias has uh, got a short in there somehow drawing far too much current Maybe the bias isn't oscillating and something like that. Not sure. But uh, the only way is to, uh, as they say, put it on the bench and test and measure the, uh, the bottom end out of it. It's very difficult to get to everything, though. The, the boards, unfortunately, don't easily fold out. I may end up uh, cutting off all the zip ties just to see if I can get extensions and also I may be able to eliminate some boards I'm hoping that's the case there's uh, ones of note which I suspect would be of uh, issue there's a main board on the top but I think that's mostly just audio and uh, control stuff then you have the large power supply control board I think down the bottom and underneath there is another board uh, it says decoder decoder encoder okay so that uh, is either Dolby oh yes Dolby dash 2 PCB so we may be able to eliminate that board from causing any trouble um, I've had the Dolby off anyway so that leaves us two major boards I suspect uh, uh, something on this power supply board though actually there's a... what's that? Oh. Oh, look what dropped out. A resistor. Oh, okay. Right, that's a, that's a good clue. Oh, that's what I wanted to say was something actually... I thought I heard something drop before. Maybe this is uh, why the smoke stopped, because there was no current passing through this anymore. Now I just have to figure out where that is, and I can start looking at the schematic then. Hmm. You can't see can't see everything I'm doing, can you? Ah, battery's just about flat. All right. All right, I'm back after the battery went on me. Okay, so this resistor fell out. Now, I have to find out where it fell out from. The fact that it fell out means what? Which board did it fall out of? All right, I'll try and find that and get back to you. Right, so 
so I've got to try and find out where that resistor came from. I wonder if it's from just... Oh, here we go. It's from there. That's it. R309. Ah. Now, from memory, those 300s are from the bias circuit. So that makes all sense in the world. I'd better go and have a look at the schematic to be sure. Yeah. I'll see if I can get a close-up picture of it for you. Okay, I've taken two pictures of uh, of the pads, and in that you can see that it's R three hundred nine. So now I am going to go to the schematic and find out what it is exactly. What happened is that uh, being upside down like this in the board just there it got so hot that it just fell out and that's what I heard I heard the tinkle tinkle so goodness that's hot all right I'll find out what it is be back well I'm back well it was pretty much as I as I thought doesn't mean it's easy enough to repair but at least I it's in the area that I thought it would be. If we have a look here, I'll try and zoom in a bit. That R309, which is the one that fell out, it is indeed the bias oscillator. It's uh, the resistor that feeds the, the bias uh, oscillator with its two transistors. So either the bias coil transformer is is toast or the two transistors one of them is toast or one of the capacitors nearby is uh, causing it not to oscillate uh, thereby drawing uh, undue current ah so now why that meant that the uh, azimuth didn't seem to want to work. I, I, oh, of course, uh, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't have been getting any signal. That's why it probably didn't work. Okay, so something intermittent in the uh, bias oscillator. So anyway, that's uh, a good find. I have, uh, I sort of half expected something like this if it was an electronic fault, was because uh, there's quite a few things on YouTube about this part of the circuit failing for one reason or another and uh, it was exactly in the area I was expecting uh, C309 sorry R309 which feeds the uh, oscillator transformer so what next well I'll probably take a, a deep breath for tonight since I only got the machine today and uh, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, peruse the uh, schematic a, a little bit more just to make sure I'm familiar with it. And I'm hoping that the uh, transformer is okay. That's, that's my cross fingers because uh, I think that's it there. If that's, uh, if that's uh, no good then, oh dear, I, I would have to then create a whole new oscillator circuit from scratch. Uh, and uh, and have like a little outrigger board but how that would affect the calibration procedure well yeah something I'd have to look into but at the moment that's uh, where we're at so there we go record is faulty as uh, as said on the uh, auction ad but it must have been an intermittent one and it's I could get up in here and find uh, well maybe one of those little red uh, polyprop capacitors is gone I have ordered a whole uh, kit to replace them for this uh, machine there's about 30 red polyprop capacitors I think and but what uh, the kit doesn't have is all of the electrolytics. 
there's heaps of electrolytics, little tiny ones that really need to be replaced as well. Uh, not sure when I'll get around to doing all that because uh, it takes a lot of sourcing to get all those little capacitors. They need to be good quality, the right uh, PCM or, or pitch and they're typically five millimeters but there's others they're 10 millimeter 10 millimeter and I think 7.5 as well and of course they need to fit and oh yeah I don't want to get rubbish capacitors they need to be fairly good quality Nich Nichicon or something like that but that'll take time to research but at least I'll have the polyprops there on their way uh, from a, a chap in the UK and uh, one step at a time as they say or in the like in the movie contact uh, small moves Ellie small moves but it's uh, provided it's only just something electronic in the bias circuit uh, it's a it's a very lovely machine and uh, I look forward to using it Oh, and when I said uh, there was a little rubber uh, belt in there caught, I was wrong. It's not black rubber belt. It's a couple of black wires that go up to the front door. And there's a little tiny globe that uh, shines in there. Unfortunately, there's no backlight uh, between the uh, reels on the cassette, so you can't see through uh, with the light. It's all from the front, and it's a very dim globe anyway. So, like... Uh, some of my other machines I'm I'm going to uh, put in a whole host of white LEDs through there the, the little pioneer I've got I've already put a uh, a white lead uh, underneath to help shine on it uh, and uh, it's a lot better that machine though unfortunately I I cracked another another switch knob on it so I'll finish that uh, video tomorrow. All right, I think that's it for now. I'm going to have a, a break from this and I'll get back to you when I next uh, start work on it.